message that is there for us. Father, I do pray that as now we open up your word to Ezekiel 38, that you would just continue to stir our hearts. Uh, Lord, we thank you that we can look at this prophecy that will be fulfilled in the latter days. And we want to be wise in the days in which we are living in. We want to be discerning. Uh, we want to be comforted, knowing that you have a glorious plan. And so we just commit this time to you as we study your word. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So Ezekiel 38 and 39, of course, speaking of that war, it's uh, titled oftentimes by, by Bible teachers, the war Gog and Magog. And it's really not even a war. It's more of a battle that takes place because it's not going to last long. And we're going to see that as uh, in chapter 36 and 37, we see the prophecy of how God's going to restore Israel. And I want you to always remember when it comes to end time prophecy, to keep in mind that Israel is the epicenter, is the focus of end time prophecy. We're going to see that very clearly as we go through Daniel, but we've also seen in Isaiah, we've seen in Jeremiah, we have seen in Ezekiel, we will also see in the minor prophets that there is an emphasis of God focusing on the nation of Israel. And the promise was they would come back from the captivity, not only just from the Babylonian captivity, as they went into uh, Babylon, the house of Judah, they're going to come back, Jeremiah would say, in chapter 29 of his, his book that we read that the Lord said, I will remember you, I will visit you. After 70 years, you'll come back into the land. And I know my thoughts towards you, the thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And the Lord was telling them that i am still got a future for you. And he made a covenant with them, the new covenant, that there's going to be time where I'm going to bring you back and I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to write my law on the tablets of your heart, no longer just the tablets of stone, a new spirit, a new beginning, um, a new life. And there's going to be that time where they're going to be restored. The Lord has said, particularly Ezekiel has emphasized it, that I will bring it to pass. You will know that I am the Lord. So the Lord promises that he's going to renew and restore Israel. And that's what chapter 36 was about. And then in chapter 37, the dry bones that live, it's amazing, absolutely amazing, that we've seen that fulfilled in, in uh, our lifetime, 73 years ago, in 1948, when Israel became a nation once again, being out of their original homeland uh, after the destruction of Jerusalem by Rome uh, and Jerusalem destroyed in the second temple, taken off to captives to all the nations. Jesus would speak about that in the Olivet Discourse. And then they would come back, and that's exactly what has happened. They became a nation once again in 1948 and we know that we're in the last days so the nation of Israel as we have seen them come back that that really began to the 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 end time clock and uh, the nation of Israel as they came and became a nation once again dry bones that were alive a nation that was dead now alive once again and what God is doing is they're rebuilding uh, the ancient cities and planting the land just as Ezekiel said, the ultimate fulfillment will come in the millennium reign when they will all come back. And then, of course, we know that in the restoration that the expansion of Israel will happen. David will sit on the throne. We uh, have seen this of Jerusalem uh, under, of course, being the under shepherd to Jesus Christ who will sit on the throne and rule the nations, all the nations with a rod of iron. But what is interesting is they're back in the land. Amos says when they come back in, they will not be plucked out again. And we also know that God is going to um, be working on behalf of Israel to prepare them for they're the only nation that is not only is it speaking of a physical restoration, and that's continuing, but there is a spiritual restoration that will happen at the end of the millennium uh, of the tribulation period leading to the millennium reign of Jesus Christ. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But before us here tonight, we began to look at Ezekiel 38 and 39 and this major battle that's going to take place in the Middle East. As we began to look at, we, I believe 
got through the first 13 verses, um, maybe perhaps through verse 17, but I'm going to uh, kind of review it real quickly, uh, that there's a confederation of nations that we know, verse 8 tells us, after many days you'll be visited in the latter years. So we know that this battle's going to take place in the latter years. You will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which has long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. So that one verse, packed with truth, tells us that God says, I'm going to bring you back into the land. You're dwelling in the mountains of Israel, in a land once again, uh, in a place that was desolate, and where you were out of the land. And in the latter days, I'm going to come and visit you. And I got a plan for you. And there's this confederation of nations, Gog, which is a title that leads Magog, which is Russia, as we defined, and the other nations that are listed there in verse 2 and in verse 3, uh, Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, uh, and again, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. That's speaking of Turkey. And then in verse 5, Persia, which is Iran, Ethiopia, uh, it might be translated Cush. It's speaking of Sudan, Libya, or with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer, which again may be a reference to Eastern Europe, or perhaps maybe those republics that broke away from the USSR uh, back in the 90s, um, in, in the 80s, that is, under uh, President Reagan when uh, the, the Soviet Union broke apart. But we know that there's going to be this large army as you will send coming like a storm covering the land, like a cloud, all your troops and many peoples with you. And it's interesting that the Lord says, I will put a hook in your jaw. The Assyrians, when they came in and took the 10 northern tribes away, they would put hooks in their jaws and, and, and take them away into captivity. The Lord says, now I'm going to put a hook in your jaw, you from the north, and I'm going to draw you in to this land. And we've seen that there's another confederation of nations not involved in this battle coming against Israel, but they're coming together in protesting on behalf of Israel. And the reason that this huge army is coming against Israel, led by Russia and, and Turkey and Iran, we know that those nations have troops that are in Syria, to the north of Israel. So I believe what we are, have been seeing over the last decade particularly is those alliances that are coming together that have never been allies since Ezekiel has written this prophecy 2,600 years ago. But we know that, uh, that here they, they are, are becoming allies. They have troops, Iran, Turkey, Russia, in Syria, entrenched in Syria. And, and we know that um, Israel is dwelling in the land, prospering. And have you come as this, this uh, confederation of nations, do, uh, as we saw in verse 13, Sheba, Dedan, that's speaking of Saudi Arabia, and Tarshish, and we know that um, it was Jonah that got in the ship. He was going to go to Tarshish, which was Western Spain, but Western Europe, perhaps, and her young lines. Could it be speaking of the United States? This is one reference that perhaps the United States is mentioned in prophecy. And what is, what is um, interesting is when you look at end-time prophecy, there are many nations that are mentioned, but the United States is not specifically mentioned. It could be a reference to Western Europe, uh, Tarshish, uh, probably is. They're protesting along with Saudi Arabia, and they're saying, why are you coming in to take the spoils, the, the plunder, the booty, to stretch out your hand against waste places that are again inhabited and against the people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land? So Saudi Arabia actually is closer to Israel, even though they've been sworn enemies ever since Israel has become a nation once again. But Saudi Arabia is afraid of Iran because Saudi Arabia is, is Sunni Muslims. Iran is Shiite. Iran has actually, in her proxies, have launched rockets into Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia has been looking to Israel, been closer to Israel. And we know that when this war happens, that Saudi Arabia, along with the Western Europe, uh, along with perhaps United States, um, 
her young lions, is going to be protesting this battle. They will not get involved in it. They will only protest. And here's the thing. Israel will find herself alone. And one of the things that we see in end time prophecy is Israel's a focus. And as God is preparing them for a spiritual, uh, you know, uh, revival, a spiritual renewal um, and restoration, that Israel is not going to be able to trust in the United States and trust in the other nations. They're going to have to turn and trust in the Lord. And at the end of the tribulation period, as Paul writes, that then their eyes will be opened up and, and as uh, blindness has come to Israel in part until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. And then all of Israel will be saved. And Joel chapter 2 talks about how they will call for a fast. And it looks like Jerusalem's going under. Zechariah chapter 14, half the city is taken. And then all of a sudden the Lord steps in and, and rescues Israel. And they receive him as their Messiah. So it's an incredible prophecy that will be fulfilled. Keep in mind, I was thinking about this in the book of Genesis, that in Genesis, uh, when Joseph would stand before Pharaoh, and, and Pharaoh said, here's my dream, and Joseph said, this, this is the interpretation of the dream, but know this, Pharaoh, that God has established it, and God will bring it to pass. Well, God has established this, and he will bring it to pass. This will happen. So this is a battle that has not happened. It is not the battle of Armageddon. It will happen in the latter days. Again, as we looked at this first portion of, of Ezekiel 38, that let's go ahead and pick it up in verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to God, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, you, um, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you, and all of them riding on horses and a great company and a mighty army. And you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be, listen, in the latter days, verse 16 once again. So we know that it's in the latter days. Verse 16 and verse 8 here dismisses replacement theology. Um, that Israel being in the land is just a coincidence. God doesn't have a plan for them. God is speaking here. They'll be back into the land. In the latter days, this is going to happen. This is going to take place. So I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O God, before their eyes. And thus says the Lord God, are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? So again, once again, we see these alliances that have been made recently in the last few years. The pieces of the puzzle is coming together. We, we are seeing stage setting events uh, for Ezekiel 38 that can take place uh, with Russia and Turkey and Iran making military alliances, treaties together there in Syria to the north. Um, and we also know that they have made alliances with Sudan and also with Libya. And we know that um, this is going to continue to bring turmoil to the Middle East. And they're going to come in and try to take the spoils. And in that confederation of nations, Saudi Arabia, the Western Europe, the United States perhaps, uh, again, uh, are going to protest, but they're not going to get involved. And then we see how God's going to intervene here. In verse 18, and it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken, surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. So here as we begin to read the judgment on Gog, on this invading army, the Lord is going to use, first of all, an earthquake. We do know that Israel is in a major earthquake area, and there is three major earthquakes that are spoken of in the book of Revelation, here there's going to be an earthquake that's going to take place. And then as we continue, uh, that so in the fish, fish of the sea, the birds of the heaven, the beasts of the fields, all creeping things that creep on the earth and all men who are on the face of the earth shall listen, shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against God through my mountains, says Throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God, every man's sword will be against his brother, 
In verse 22, I will bring him to judgment with pestilence, with bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many people who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself. I will be known in the eyes of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord. So God's going to intervene in a very dramatic way here, as there's going to be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, verse 19. But also, as he says, that men, that all men who are on the face of the earth, not just in Israel, shall shake at my presence. They know that God is intervening here somehow. The mountains are going to be thrown down. Isn't that interesting? So is this earthquake going to cause some geologic upheaval? Uh, the steep places fall. Walls shall fall down. And I will call for my sword against Gog. Every man's sword will be against his brother. Now, it reminds you of something as the, the, the troops, that invading army, that they're going to turn on each other. They're going to, as we know, that, um, that they're going to turn on each other. We're going to see that this is kind of a preview to chapter 39, which speaks of the cleanup of the war, continuing to speak of God's judgment against them. But it reminds us of the book of Judges in chapter 7. And in Judges chapter 7, Gideon, as his 300 men went against an overwhelming number of Midianites, 135,000 of them, and when they walked up the hills surrounding the Midianites, uh, you know the story, many of you. You can read it in Judges chapter 7 and in verse 22. When they broke the clay pots that had coals in it, that the clay pots, the, the, the air rushing into the clay pots, that would ignite those coals. And they blew the trumpets. And as they blew the trumpet, they held the torches in their left hands, the trumpet in their right hands were blowing, and they cried, The sword of the Lord in Gideon. And when the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord said, Every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. So this is how the Lord destroyed the Midianites. They began to turn on each other through the confusion and through the fear. And here in Ezekiel 38, not only earthquake, not only is, is his presence is going to be evident on all those on the face of the earth as God intervenes in a dramatic way. But they will begin to turn on each other like in Judges chapter 7 and begin to, to, to take the sword against one another. Also, verse 22, what is interesting, I will bring judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. So pestilence is mentioned here as well. What exactly is the pestilence? We just went through a pandemic. And it's interesting that we pray that, oh Lord, may we not go through in our lifetime another pandemic, what we went through. But we know that pestilence are mentioned, I believe, uh, like 13 times in the book of Revelation. And it is mentioned here in Ezekiel chapter 38. So pestilence is going to be part of the judgment that's going to come upon them, bloodshed. And we know that there's going to be great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Remember in the book of of Joshua that the Lord used hailstones against uh, the enemies of the children of Israel that were coming into the land. So all these things are going to be taking place and the Lord says, I will magnify myself and we know that, um, that God is going to judge those nations. So Ezekiel 39, as we see that God's going to very dramatically um, in a powerful way is going to defend Israel at this time. Ezekiel 39 continues to talk about how those armies are destroyed, but also what is interesting is the cleanup of that battle. It's the only chapter in scripture that speaks of a cleanup after a battle, and I find it very significant. Let's look at chapter 39, and you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rush, Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you around and lead you on, bringing you up from the far north and bringing you against the mountains of Israel. So here, it, it, God is in control. God is allowing this to happen. I'm going to put a hook in your jaw and bring you from the north. So we know that it's going to come from the north into the mountains of Israel here. I'm going to turn you around, lead you on, and... and we know that, that God is going to allow this to happen so that 
as they do come in, that he's going to intervene and judge those armies that come against them. And in verse 3, I will knock the bow out of your left hand and cause the arrow to fall out of your right hand. So remember that Ezekiel, that he is, he's looking at this and he's using uh, language that the reader at that time, they don't understand missiles and, and all of that that is used today. And it isn't going to be an army that's going to come with bow and arrows, but whatever weaponry is going to be used is going to fail here. And that's what verse 3 is saying here. And you shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, verse 4, all in all your troops and the peoples who are with you. I will give you birds of prey of every sort to the beasts of the field to be devoured. That's what we're going to see in verses 17 through 20 that is spoken of. So there's going to be many deaths that are going to come. And you shall fall on the open field for I have spoken, says the Lord God. So uh, earthquake's going to happen, fire and brimstone, they're going to turn on each other uh, with their swords and the confusion. Their weapons are going to fail uh, and fall out of their left hand and out of their right hand. And they're going to be given over to the birds of prey. This is a great devastation of this army. And you shall fall in the open field. And I will send, verse 6, and this is a verse that really intrigues me, that I will send fire on Magog and on those who live in security in the coastlands. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Now, what exactly does that mean? He says, I'm going to send fire on Magog, that is on Russia. Is it speaking just of the troops, or is it actually speaking of judgment that will come upon the land? But what really kind of concerns me and on those who live in security on the coastlands now who's those who live securely on the coastlands i don't know there's no details given to this verse but it's just more than right there in israel but there's going to be fire on magog and there is going to be on those who live securely in the coastland what does that mean does it mean that there's going to be a nuclear exchange that's going to happen somehow is that what's being spoken of here? We don't know for sure, but you wonder. And this verse uh, really intrigues me. And then in verse 7, So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. And then in verse 8, Surely it is coming and shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day which I have spoken. Then those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers and the bows and the arrows and the javelins and spears, and they will make fires with them for seven years. Verse 9, take note of that. For seven years, they're going to be burning the weapons that fell out of their hands, that failed, that are laying all over the place, and they will not take wood from the field nor cut down any of the forest because they will make fires with the weapons and they will plunder those who plundered them and pillage those who pillaged them, says the Lord God. So as this invading army is destroyed by the Lord, that Israel is going to go out and is going to burn the weapons for seven years. Now, that's intriguing because in a little bit, I'm going to talk about the timing of Gog and Magog. When is it going to happen? But I think that plays a factor in the timing of this battle that will take place. Second of all, what is interesting is they're going to take seven years to burn the weapons. And, uh, you know, one of the things when they cleaned up, and I got a good source on this, a friend who is a nuclear engineer that was part of the cleanup of Rocky Flats just south of here by Denver, when they cleaned that all up and they dismantled uh, Rocky Flats um, nuclear site, um, they would get rid of the weapons that were there. And how they got rid of the weapons is they burned them, the, the nuclear weapons. And it took seven years for them to do that. And when my good friend told me that, I, I just thought Ezekiel chapter 39. Matter of fact, he told me that after we were doing a teaching. That's exactly what we did. We burned those, those weapons for seven years it took. So could it be that the nuclear weapons that were used, that they failed and they went out and they burned those, those get rid of those weapons for seven years? It's interesting. Ezekiel's writing this 2,500 years ago. And he's looking down through history and seeing this and, and this vision that he has. How incredible it must have been for him. And, and, and 
as we see that the burial of Gog is now mentioned in verse 11, it will come to pass in that day that I will give Gog a burial place there in Israel, the valley of those who pass by the east of the sea. It will obstruct travelers because they will bury Gog and his multitude. Therefore, they will call on it the valley of Ham and Gog. For seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Verse 13. Indeed, the people of the land will be burying and they will gain renown for the day that I am glorified, says the Lord. Verse 14. I will set apart men regularly employed with the help of a search party to pass through the land to bury those bodies remaining on the ground in order to cleanse it. And at the end of seven months, they will take a search. For seven months that the house of Israel will cleanse the land. And at the end of seven months, they will begin to make a search. And it's interesting that verse 14 tells us that there are men that are regularly employed um, with the search party are going to pass through the land and bury those bodies remaining on the ground in order to cleanse it. And they will pass through the land. And when anyone, verse 15, listen, sees a man's bone, he shall set up a marker by it till the barriers have buried in the valley Ham and Gog. And the name of the city will also be Hamoth, uh, Hamonah, thus they shall cleanse the land. Isn't that fascinating? So for seven months, they got to go in. Uh, after seven months, they go in with a search party. Those regularly that are employed, and they put a flag, they put a marker by the bodies that will be there. And then there's going to be a large burial place that seems to be around the Dead Sea area that they're going to use. Again, I was talking to somebody years ago that was in the military, and they heard this teaching, and they said, that's what I was trained to do. I was trained to, to go in after a biological, chemical, nuclear exchange, and we go and we mark the bodies. Uh, we can't touch them because the bones are poisonous, the bodies are poisonous. And that seems like that's what Ezekiel is describing to us. And it, again, it is interesting that it's the only chapter that speaks of the cleanup, and it's like it's telling us that today we are in the latter days, that this could happen. There, we have the technology of nuclear weapons, chemical, biological weapons that could be used to where the bodies can't be touched. And those regularly employed, that would be soldiers that would go in and then mark the bodies and then have a burial to have to cleanse the land. And as I think about this, this is so... Uh, fascinating to see how exact Ezekiel is talking about this. Um, the burial for the bodies will be for seven months and, and, and the bones not being touched and setting up a marker and all of that. So here's the question that you might be asking. What is the timing of Ezekiel 38, this war? We know that there's been stage setting events that have taken place to where Russia has entrenched in Syria. We know that Turkey is there. We know that Iran is there with the Iranian guards and um, their you know, military, the proxies of Iran, Hezbollah. Matter of fact, when we went to Israel, as we were overlooking right there at the border of Syria, that our tour guide was telling us that there's Hezbollah there, there's Iranian troops that are right over there, right down the road there as you look down the valley. And their desire is, Iran says, that we want to destroy Israel. And that's why Israel takes it very, very seriously. And, of course, it's a study for another time that perhaps we'll get into. But Iran, that they are driven, their, their, um, you know, um, uh, their foreign policy, if you would, uh, by their beliefs, the Ayatollahs that they're going to usher in Iran, a caliphate. They're going to usher in the 12th Iman that's going to come and use mass destruction to do away with Israel, the little Satan, and the United States, the great Satan. So there is concern. When they say that they want to destroy Israel, they mean it. They want to destroy Israel. So Iran's trying to get entrenched to be the leader in the Middle East right now. And, of course, they're going to continue, I believe, to be in the news as well as Russia. Now, what we're seeing also in Israel is there seems to be, to date, 
that there's going to be a change in, in leadership, that Benjamin Netanyahu, who, who is very strong on national security, the prime minister over the last several years, the longest um, sitting prime minister in Israel's history, that he probably could very well be ousted and then a new government forms and a new uh, prime minister. So God is setting those in authority that, that could it be that we're going to see more tension that's going to happen in the Middle East. We saw it just recently as, once again, Hamas in the Gaza Strip was launching missiles into Israel. They are supported by Iran, and we're going to see more upheaval. We're going to see more uh, of this you know, entrenching of Russia and Turkey and Iran, I believe, into the Middle East. And we see that Israel continues to prosper in the Middle East as well. So we are watching it very closely. So the timing of Ezekiel 38, it doesn't tell us, we know it's in the latter days, in the latter years that it's going to take place. It's going to take place once they come back into the land. So it is yet future. There are those Bible scholars, very good Bible teachers of end time prophecy that have suggested that Ezekiel 38 will take place in the middle of the tribulation period and will lead to the battle of Armageddon. We know that this is not the battle of Armageddon because the battle of Armageddon has different players that are there. It's in a different location. Um, and we know that after the battle of Armageddon that the Lord is going to come back. So this is different here. This is a different battle with Russia being involved and leading it. And Gog, the, the leader of Russia in this uh, confederation of nations. So some believe it's going to be in the middle of the tribulation period and will lead to the battle of Armageddon. Some say that it's going to be in the beginning of the tribulation period uh, when the second seal, that death comes to men. Uh, that perhaps that's going to be the, the timing of it, Ezekiel 38. Some have suggested that it will be before the tribulation period. And, and I'll tell you why. And it's interesting to think about it. That remember that it takes seven years for them to burn the weapons. It's going to take seven months for them, you know, after seven months here, burying them in order to cleanse. And as he says, at the end of seven months, they will make a search. So the bodies are going to remain there um, on the ground in order to cleanse it. But we do know that they're burning the weapons for seven years. So if it takes seven years for them to do that. Very unlikely that it's going to be in the middle of the tribulation period because what happens in the middle of the tribulation period? What happens is, is the Antichrist goes into the tribulation temple and he's going to proclaim himself as God, to be worshipped as God. And we know that from Second Thessalonians chapter 2. He will then turn and tell the world to worship him. He'll destroy the false church that is on the scene. He'll set up an image of himself. He's going to declare himself to be God, to be worshipped as God, because he's under the influence of Satan. Satan's always wanted to be worshipped. And the Jews are going to reject him. There's going to be a remnant of the Jews that are going to have to flee to the rock city of Petra. We have studied this before in our end time studies. As Isaiah speaks of that and also Revelation chapter 12, that they'll flee to the wilderness and the Antichrist will pursue them. They will be a remnant of them are going to be tucked away in Petra, the rock city Petra that you can go. We've been there before on one of our trips. They're very fascinating, this rock city uh, that has been carved out of the rocks, a very narrow entrance into uh, the uh, Petra, which is in today Jordan. They just built a four-lane highway to take you there. Um, and so they will flee as the Antichrist will begin to persecute the Jews very, very heavily at that time. Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of, Daniel the prophet, then flee, get out of there. And we will talk more about that as we go through the book of Daniel. At that time also that the Antichrist will demand that you take the mark of the beast, make your allegiance to me to be able to buy or sell. And chapter 13, he will war against the tribulation saints and begin to heavily persecute the tribulation saints. Um, he will behead them. He will put them to death. We see the blood of the martyrs mentioned there in the book 
of revelation. It is going to be a time of tribulation, as Jesus said, such as the world has not seen or ever will see again. And at that time, it will lead up to the Battle of Armageddon at the end of the tribulation period, that last world war that will take place in the Valley of Megiddo. But at that time, I doubt if Israel is going to be able to go out there and burn those weapons, um, even at the beginning of the tribulation period. So some have suggested that it's going to take place before the tribulation period. Is it going to take place before the rapture of the church? I suppose it could happen. I believe that the church will be raptured uh, before the tribulation period. Uh, we saw that, and I mentioned it on Sunday, that the promise given to the church of Philadelphia is that it will take you out of and away from the hour of trial or tribulation that shall come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. Those who dwell on the earth, uh, that is a reference to non-believers. And then also the only time that there's going to be trial or tribulation on the whole earth is during the tribulation period. And so he said, I'm going to take you out of and away from it, not through it. So I believe that we're going to be taken out, plus other reasons why I believe that the church will be raptured. And that's why Jesus said, you be the wise and faithful servant that is looking for the master's return. Because I come at a time, listen, day you least expect. So could Ezekiel 38 take place before the tribulation period? I believe that it could. Could it take place before the rapture? I, I don't know. We don't know the day or the hour the Lord comes back. We don't know the day or the hour of Ezekiel 38 being fulfilled. This is my personal um, you know, opinion. This is my two cents, and that's all it's worth. And I'm, I'm as wrong as anybody else when it comes to the timing, or don't take this as thus saith the Lord. But Jesus, when he talks about his return to be watching when I come when you least expect, we know that Jesus also talked about it will be like the days of, of uh, Noah. Uh, the days of Noah where they were, you know, given to, to marriage and um, they didn't know that the judgment was going to come in the flood. They weren't expecting it. And Jesus talking about the coming of the Son of Man is like that. It's going to be suddenly, it's going to be uh, dramatic, it's going to be complete. And the world, of course, would be under that judgment. Then Sodom and Gomorrah, he would say, like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, where they bought and they sold. And, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, it was economically prosperous. It was culturally stimulating. And things were going on, and they didn't believe. It. Lot's family didn't believe. Judgment's going to come on us, and then it rained fire and brimstone. So there's some sense of when you least expect and an hour that you do not know, Jesus said, that is when my coming is. And that's another reason why I believe that the church is going to be raptured before the tribulation period because we have that doctrine of Im, uh, imminent return. That he says, I can come at any time. There is no prophecy that has to be fulfilled for Jesus to come for his church. That's why we should be living every day that, Lord, perhaps you can come back today, not knowing the day or the hour, but the times and seasons, we know that we're in the last days, that we are to be watching. That is a command of the Lord. That is what we are to do, to comfort one another with these words. As we see these things begin to come to pass, Jesus said, look up and rejoice, for your redemption draws near. And we're seeing these things that the Bible speaks of that is beginning to be fulfilled. You know, Israel coming back into the land. Uh, stage setting events, Ezekiel 38. They're wanting to rebuild the temple. They're getting everything in line. You can look at it and all the birth pangs that we'll be talking about most specifically when we get to the Olivet Discourse. Um, and, and we are in the last days. So I think that leading up to that, I believe that the rapture can happen at any moment. If we're that close to seeing Ezekiel 38 happen, and, the, and again, they, they could be in, in Syria for days, weeks, months, years, but it could happen very, very quickly. I believe that the rapture of the church, that we're very, very close to it, that it could happen before Ezekiel 38. Keep in mind that between the rapture of the church and the beginning of the tribulation period, there may be a gap of time. Uh, we don't know how long it is. Uh, sometimes we think that the rapture will happen and then the next day the Antichrist comes on the scene. We do know that when the church, which is a restraining factor, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, 
is taken out of the way, then lawlessness will begin to fill the world. And of course, because the church is gone, we are a restraining factor. And, and, and I, I believe it won't be long before the Antichrist, the lawless one, will come on the scene. So we don't know exactly when Ezekiel 38 can happen, but I, I do believe that we are so close to the return of the Lord that that's my prayer is that, that the Lord would come back at a time that we're least expected, um, and we're to be discerning the days in which we're in, and that this battle will take place that we just talked about. Let's finish the chapter very quickly in verse 17 as we see that um, here again speaking, that as for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to every sort of bird and every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves and come gather together from all sides to my sacrificial meal, which I am sacrificing for you, a great sacrificial meal on the mountains of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink blood, that you eat the flesh of the mighty, drink the blood of the princess of the earth, the rams and the uh, lambs and the goats and bulls and the fatlings of Bashan, that you shall eat fat till you are full and drink blood till you are drunk. At my sacrificial meal, which I am sacrificing for you, you shall be filled at my table with horses and rider, with mighty men, with all the men of war, says the Lord. So just this, this, this the birds coming and, um, and coming and eating the flesh of the mighty that is there and drinking the blood of the princes uh, in this battle. And then in verse 21, I will set my glory among the nations. All the nations shall see my judgment, which I've executed in my hand, which I've laid on them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. The Gentiles shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they were unfaithful to me. Therefore, I hide my face from them. I will give them into the hand of their enemies, and they all fell by the sword, according to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions. I have dealt with them and hid my face from them. So they went into captivity because of their sin and refusal to repent. And today God has protected them and will continue to do so, and they will see that God is working in their midst, and then God will pour out his spirit on them. For now that they are... Still, you know, there's a blindness that has come to Israel in part. And then in verse 25, as we finish the chapter, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Now I will bring back the captives of Jacob, and have mercy in the whole house of Israel, and I will be jealous for my, my holy name, after they have borne their shame, and all their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me, when they dwelt safely in their own land, and no one made them afraid. When I brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of the enemies and lands, I am hallowed in them in the sight of many nations. Verse 28. Then they shall know that I am the Lord their God who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back into their land and left none of them captive any longer. And I will not hide my face from them any more, for I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord. So we saw that God brought them back. After World War II, um, we know that, um, that God uh, will preserve a remnant of them when the Antichrist comes against them. And at the end of the tribulation period, Jesus said, I will gather his elect, my elect, from the four winds of the earth, and the Lord will restore Israel in the millennium reign, which we're going to talk about as we get into chapter 40. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you so much for this incredible couple chapters that we've looked at. And Lord, how close are we to the war of Gog and Magog? We don't know for sure. But how close are we to your return? And I pray that we would, first of all, be discerning of the days in which we are in. Second of all, that it would bring comfort to us, that we wouldn't look at this and, and be afraid, but know that you're in control. And you have a glorious plan for your bride, the church, and that is to take us home, and that we're to be watching and waiting. And we are to be the faithful servant that continues to serve you until the time that you come for us, or come for us personally. And Lord, I pray that we would keep our eyes on you, and that we would be not weighed down with the cares of life and the things of the world, that that day should overtake us unexpectedly, as Jesus said. But Lord, that we would pray always, to be counted worthy, to escape the things that shall come to pass. 
um, and stand before the Son of Man. Um, we are to be watching. Um, we are to pay attention. These are exciting days where the church in Israel is on the scene for the first time in 2,000 years. And Lord, that um, we want to be comforted by this. I do pray, Lord, that um, as we continue knowing that Jesus is going to come back and set up his kingdom, that we would be blessed, we would be able to not only be strengthened ourselves, but Lord, to be able to minister to others and be able to, to, just as Daniel came out and interpreted the handwriting on the wall, we see the handwriting on the wall. Your return is, is soon. That these are perilous times. That Lord, the very things that you spoke of are coming to pass. That we can look up and rejoice for our redemption draws to you. I pray that you would continue to use us as a church to proclaim truth, to proclaim your coming, um, to be light to others, to give the message of hope that Jesus Christ died for them and wants to save them, that he is anyone's salvation, any man or woman that turns to him for forgiveness of sin and knows that Jesus is on the throne and will establish his kingdom. So, Father, bless everyone here now. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God bless you. Hope to see you on Sunday. And have a great rest of the week. The night is up, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will say, I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in